Hey everybody, I hope you're sitting down. More importantly, I hope you're side sitting down. I got about 30 minutes away from the kids. I'm John Tatey. Let's quickly have another basement breakdown. Okay. Season five, episode five, Dedicado a Max. The title often invites us to look for double meanings, plays on words, and this plaque on the fountain certainly lives up to that tradition. Uh, But I'm going to build up to that by taking stock of Mike halfway through season five. Season four ended with Mike shooting Werner in that heartbreaking scene in the desert. Werner was the closest thing Mike had to a friend. And in the season five premiere, we get a glimpse of Mike's state of mind. I think there's an important exchange here in the desert when one of the construction crew comes up to Mike and says to him, He was worth 50 of you. He, meaning Werner, was worth 50 of you. Mike's reaction indicates that he probably agrees with this valuation. Maybe he even finds it a little high. And that scene ends with this shot from inside the truck that I think captures Mike's emotional state of being right then. He feels small, empty, boxed in. That would be bad enough. I have to imagine that killing your friend on behalf of a drug lord leads to some pretty profound grief. But Mike also, of course, carries around this longer lasting, deeper wound of his son. The late son who followed Mike into police work, the son who Mike failed to protect from dirty cops, dirty cops like himself. I broke my boy. This is the story we saw in the first season episode 5-0. That wound gets re-exposed in the treehouse scene that took place in 50% Off. Mike's granddaughter Kaylee is asking about her father. He was a good cop, right? And you taught him, right? And then she says, But the bad guys got him? I told you to make those even. In that moment, there's nothing left in this world for Mike, and this is why he blows up. He's just hitting an emotional bottom because Kaylee is his last human connection in the world. The last thing giving him some sense of purpose and hope. When she gives voice to this intense self-judgment that he's worked so hard to overcome, it sets off the self-destructive spiral that we see in this season and that ultimately lands him at the Gus Fring South of the Border Rehab Center. Which brings us to this episode, Dedicado a Max. And the first shot of this episode is Mike emerging from this darkness and slowly coming into focus. And I think it sets up an arc in this episode when Mike brings himself into focus. His first step is deciding to live. When we see Mike step out on this excursion to nowhere, I think what we're seeing is Mike stepping out to take a look at death. Really. He wears khakis, a light shirt, a dark jacket. It's the same basic uniform that Mike wears when Walter White kills him in Breaking Bad. Shut the fuck up. Let me die in peace. So even though we know this is not when Mike dies, it does have the specter of death hanging over it. When the doctor asks Mike, will you allow me to keep you alive? Mike agrees, but I think he doesn't yet really know why. Throughout this episode, we see Mike asking, why am I here? Why save me? What am I worth to Fring? Because in Mike's calculation, he's practically worthless. So why live? Well, he gropes his way toward an answer. Maybe his outlook starts to shift when he emerges from getting stitched up for the second time and comes to this beautiful fountain. There are water images throughout this episode. Mike's caretaker offers him a glass of water. Water pours into the house during that rainstorm. I see it as a cleansing force, and perhaps it even has a baptismal quality to it, at least as applied to Mike. An important caveat, and we'll get to that. Mike approaches the fountain holding this black jacket. I see it as a just blob of darkness on the screen, and he's holding against his wound in this defensive posture. He uses this darkness to conceal his wounds. Then we come to that shot of Mike directly in line of the water flow as he has what could be seen as a cleansing moment. These kids come running through. A girl bumps against him. Her blue backpack falls to the ground, and so does the darkness Mike was clutching. And what does he pick up first? The backpack. He helps the girl, who's about Kaylee's age, and to me is a clear stand-in for his granddaughter. And by the way, speaking of stand-ins, in the background, there's this red and gold rooster looking on. How perfect, sometimes you just get lucky when you're shooting something, but how perfect that the rooster looks on as this exchange is happening. The rooster suggests a role for Mike, a way that he can keep going. He can operate on the red and gold side of society and still watch over from a distance, protect Kaylee, keep her on the blue side. He doesn't necessarily have to taint her. 
As he walks away, he carries the black jacket away from his body. The darkness is still there, but he's not clutching it so tight. Most importantly, he's not using it to conceal his wound. He's letting his vulnerabilities be exposed to the open air. And then we see it, dedicado a Max. Now, the plaque has a literal meaning related to Gus Fring's history, and we'll get to that, but we see it first in this episode in the context of Mike. What does it say about Mike? Well, in the context of Mike, I think you can read it with just a tiny bit of wordplay as dedicated to the Max. Not only is this what Gus sees in Mike, he sees him as a dedicated soldier, but more to the point in this moment, it speaks to Mike's dedication to Kaylee. Whatever Mike thinks of his past mistakes, he can find a sense of purpose in that maximal dedication he has to his granddaughter. It's what can give him life right now. Look, it's not an instant epiphany that comes over Mike because he does spend some more time banging himself against the walls of this cage that he sees himself in. We have this great misdirection where we think it's gonna be another MacGyver Mike sequence and he's crossing the wires and we've got that industrial tinkering music going on and then his caretaker just plops the phone charger right on the table, right? The message is that this, this taking apart the radio, this scheming, Mike, that's not what you're here for. He's directing all his energy outward. He wants to make the call out, right? And she says, fine, go ahead, because you're not going to get any answers, right? And the Gus Fring call does prove to be a dead end. Remember what she said to Mike early on in this episode, local calls only. The only one who can answer Mike's questions about himself are himself. He has to make the local call. And indeed, his focus does shift to the local. He allows himself to simply be still, to heal, to find himself again. He throws himself into fixing the windowsill, clearing out the old rotten wood, and then we have this shot of him putting in a fresh new plank. It's a visual echo of the last thing we saw him do with Kaylee when he slid a plank of wood about the same size in to give her a step up to her treehouse. So now we see Mike, newly cleansed, come to his meeting with Gus. Light shirt, light pants. The darkness seems to be purged from him. And here is Gus, standing in the line of the water's flow. In fact, watch here as they use staging, a camera move, and the geometry of the fountain to make it seem like the flow of the water is following Gus as he moves. Just great shot making. Is Gus, too, being cleansed? Well, I don't think so. Um, the fountain has a very different reading for Gus. Because Dedicato a Max is a reference to Gus's former business partner, his late business partner, Max. And Gus considered Max like a brother. He's the other hermano in Los Pollos Hermanos, as we learned in the Breaking Bad episode, entitled appropriately enough, Hermanos. In that episode, in a flashback, we saw Gus watch Max bleed to death after Hector Salamanca shot him in the head at Don Eladio's pool. When your friend bled out at a pool while you watched, how dark is it to build a water feature in his memory? It's pretty dark, in my opinion. So for Gus, this fountain is an object of pure revenge. And that's why it's the last line he speaks in this episode. Understand what? Revenge. This beautiful shot of Gus addressing Mike as he's trying to entice him back into the fold says so much to me. Gus seems to be knee deep in the water and I see it almost as like a vessel that's slowly filling up around him. I think we're seeing the part of Gus that is still back at that pool, still drowning in sorrow over his dead companion, Max. And in this shot, we also see Mike in light clothing, the sun shining on his face, cleansed. He has brought himself into focus, into the light. Gus's side of the frame is anchored in darkness, and Mike is going to step into that darkness with Gus, but I think that the contrast between the two figures in this shot emphasizes that they internally are coming from different places. Mike has his own reasons beyond revenge that factor into his decision. He has his reasons for revenge against the Salamancas. We've seen that over the course of the show, but right now there's something beyond that, namely Kaylee, that I think is driving him. In this way, the same symbol, the fountain, is seen through two different human lenses and to draw out such different qualities of these two characters we know so well. It's such thoughtful filmmaking, and I'm sure some of you will have even further ways to read this fountain. I'm all ears. Share it in the comments, as always. I would love to get your interpretations. Oh, by the way, if any of you know why the three A's in the plaque are a little brighter than the other letters, I'm all ears. It could just be another three. They'd like to hide them in there, but maybe there's something there. I have no idea. 
Let's turn to the Jimmy Saul Kim storyline. I'll begin by tracing Saul's wardrobe over the course of the episode because I think it's a nice illustration of Saul's growing swagger here. He starts out blending in. Did you notice him poke himself into this circle of faces? I did not notice it at first. Saul starts out sort of camouflaged, or blending in as much as Saul really can. The wardrobe designers have put him in a color scheme that matches the crew foreman, and that fits his attitude early on here, right? He just wants to find a solution. He wants to do things right. Dotting the I's in due diligence, he says, right? But he makes it seem as if, hey, we're all on the same side. We want to find a solution. Wouldn't you like to know you got the right place. Later, when the archaeological team is digging up his fake pottery, the color scheme of his outfit matches this giant excavator that's behind him. But the pretense that Saul is working with the construction crew does fall away with time, and eventually, you know, he's here to make trouble, and he doesn't care who knows about it at a certain point. As the delays build and Saul comes up with new plays to execute, his colors clash more and more with the surroundings. Saul is straight out peacocking now. He's owning the chicanery. But Saul has a tell, and I talked about it in the breakdown for Namaste. It's here again, this mug. Watch the mug. Saul conceals Kim's second best paint job, the paint job that identifies him as number two lawyer throughout the episode. The Mr. Acker montage even ends with Saul giving that mug a second look, almost like he's checking his grip on it. There is one shot before you nail me in the comments where the camera does show the two, but Saul always hides it from the other people in the scene. Again, my read here is that the number two is vulnerable Jimmy McGill, feeling second best, and Saul is shielding that vulnerability from the world in a way that's not terribly different from Mike shielding his own wound, right? The physicality of these two shots is not so different. Jimmy is still in there, but Saul continues to grow, and it raises the question of whether Kim can still control him. He seems insatiable back at the apartment when he entices Kim by saying, There's always another play. And they are playing, aren't they? They're playing their favorite game, stick it to the man. Jimmy's feeling the rush, and Kim's feeling it too. They are living those old thrills, experiencing those feelings of power, with higher stakes than ever. But let's back up to the first apartment scene because it's, it's a really fruitful scene that illuminates a lot of what's happening with Kim. The scene operates on this brilliant premise of Kim play acting as Mesa Verde CEO Kevin Wachtel and Jimmy playing the part of Kim. I need that call center real bad. Of course, Kevin. Wait, are you being me? And I find this a fascinating reversal because the whole premise of this Mr. Acker scheme is that Kim is the puppet master, right? She's the one with her hand up Saul's butt making him talk. She's pulling his strings, for a less graphic metaphor, if you will. But in this scene, Jimmy is the one making Kim talk. And again, it playfully raises the question of who's in control here, Jimmy, Kim, or anyone? There are a bunch of important lines in this scene. First, this peculiar side-sitting exchange. Now, I've told you before to watch out when the characters say the name of a color, right? Especially one of those essential, better call Saul colors of blue and gold. Blue, the world of the right and the moral, and gold, the world of the criminal, the transgressive. Here's an example I didn't catch until I rewatched the scene. When Jimmy says, He's a side sitter. I guess so. Okay, well, you never told me that he was a side sitter. And that is gold. What does Jimmy see in that side sitter image? Well, I think he sees what Kim brings out in her Kevin Wachtel performance. He sees a man who wants what he wants and feels so entitled that maybe he's willing to bend the rules a little bit to get what he wants. Kim says, No, you do whatever it takes. I don't like waiting one bit. Never have, never will. When Jimmy says that side sitting is gold, he even draws a frame with his fingers, right? So I'm sitting here thinking, well, I better watch out for side sitting now. Jimmy basically told me to. And here it is, the moment when Kevin Wachtel is confronted with the perfectly rational plan, really the smart option to move the call center to the alternate site, he shifts into side sitting. This is Kevin's tell. Uh, to use another poker term, I think it's his tell that he's going on tilt, that he's making decisions out of wounded pride, out of emotion, instead of rationality and calm business sense. After the side sitting, he stands up against this backdrop of the painting. And we've seen this painting before at the Schweikert and Coakley offices, but it really hit me different in this shot. The phrase that came to mind was manifest destiny. The painting reminded me of American West landscape paintings of the late 19th century. Painters like 
Thomas Moran and Albert Bierstadt who painted an America that had fulfilled its manifest destiny. And I think that Lot 1120 is Kevin Wachtel's manifest destiny. His drive to expand has grown so much that he's come to view it almost as his birthright. My dad did not raise me to run from a fight. I'm not saying this episode is an allegory for 19th century American expansionism, but it is the sort of aesthetic undercurrent that's running under everything. In the photos of Kevin Wachtel's home, we see what appear to be Charles Marion Russell paintings of the frontier, same period. And Saul casts Mr. Acker as the native against the colonizers, um, even burying fake Native American pottery, which makes the parallel explicit. But that's just a little sort of side rabbit hole. The more important point here is just that Kevin's big painting moment has him looking epic and monumental, framed in gold, towering over the table. And it gets at why Kim is so willing to work against Kevin. I was struck by this one detail that Kim brings out when she's doing her impression of Kevin Wachtel. She says, Bottom line, breaking ground, more statues. Statues have always loomed large in the Mesa Verde storyline, often literally. Our first glimpse of Mesa Verde HQ is dominated by this huge cowboy statue. In season four, we see Kim in this room of models that Kevin has built to visualize his dream of ever more branches. After that meeting, she pauses again in front of the giant statue, and each time she helps Kevin Wachtel open a new branch, it means another statue on her office shelves. The billboard at the Tookum Carry site offers the promise of yet another statue. You can understand how Kim might feel that she spent a lot of time and energy helping a rich banker build more monuments to himself. Not exactly the spiritually fulfilling fight for justice legal career she had in mind. Now Kevin Wachtel is forcing her to harass an old man who just wants to be left alone. And for what? In her eyes, for the sake of just another statue. Kim's annoyance at Kevin has festered into resentment and almost hatred because he pushes her to be a worse person than she wants to be with all these statues, with his drive for statues. So how delicious is it for Kim when she's probing for some weakness in the photos of Kevin Wachtel's home, and she finds it in the statue itself. His grandest expression of pride proves to be his crucial weakness. And the irony puts one hell of a smile on Kim's face. I wanna go back to the scene in the kitchen one more time. Jimmy slash Saul, playing the role of Kim, says, Kevin? Yes, Kim? Would you care to take a shower with me? Well, shoot. I believe I would. It recalls the moment in 50% Off when Kim douses Jimmy in the shower. Her face lit up then and she lights up now. The shower exchange does give us a feel for the emotional high that Kim and Jimmy are riding. They get excited to the point of arousal when they're putting one over on the man, right? But again, we have this water imagery, this shower, this cleansing act, getting clean together. I think it gives voice to this idealized cycle that Kim envisions. She and Jimmy can get down in the muck, get a little dirty, but in the morning they can clean themselves up. She can clean herself up at least, and the rest of the world is none the wiser. That's how Kim thinks it works, because mostly that's how it has worked. She has done some bad things with Jimmy, but she's still viewed as a paragon of her profession by her colleagues. Except one. It's pretty surprising when Rich Schweikert shows up in this boardroom scene, isn't it? Like the scene has been going on for a while before we have a shot that includes him. And the surprise makes you feel like, whoa, has Rich been there the whole time? Has he been watching Kim the whole time? Well, as we find out, Yes, he has. He's been keeping his eyes on Kim, and he's got her pretty well made, right? He's on to her, as we see in this scene in Kim's office. I'm thinking you could take a break from Mesa Verde. This is a pretty generous offer that Rich extends, given the level of malfeasance that's taking place here. He basically offers her a hand out of the Saul Goodman tar pit that she's stuck in, and offers her a quiet way to save face. Just take a break. Yeah, it'll look a little bad, but we'll move on. Kim can't take this offer, though, because if she does, she can never be totally clean again. It's a black mark on her record, even if just one person, Rich Schweikert, knows about it. She needs to be totally clean. What are you saying exactly? So she chooses to stay on this path of self-destruction, but she's in a panic. You know that. We so rarely get the handheld camera look, this shaky cam that conveys emotional agitation when Kim is in the frame. The show tends to shoot Kim steady because she's one of the steadier characters. So when we do have the shaky cam in this scene, it's especially startling, and it gives us a taste of Kim's disorientation and alarm. A telling line of this confrontation comes when Kim's in the hallway and she says to Rich, 
Please tell me why I would risk everything for some squatter. Yeah, it's a rhetorical question, but Kim asks it with such force. On some level, she would really like to know the answer to this question, right? She's scared and suddenly wondering why she's risking this career she has spent years building for the sake of some old man in the desert who doesn't even like her. Rich gave her an out and she didn't take it. So now the die is cast. You know, when Gus and Mike finally meet in this episode, Gus talks to Mike about his increasingly desperate behavior and says to him, We both know how that ends. When Rich says to Kim, If that's how you want it. I think he knows how her story ends too. That ends this Basement Breakdown. As always, share your readings in the comments. I love to hear what you see in the show. And if you made it this far in the video, you probably had a good time. So why not click that subscribe button down there? Thank you to Brendan Leonard for your intrepid editing work. I can hear my kids upstairs, so I gotta get going. I'll see you again soon. Thanks for watching. Bye.